Good evening and welcome. I'm Terry Sanchez, Programs Coordinator here, and on behalf of the Newport Beach Public Library, welcome to this evening's program featuring legendary Kareem Abdul-Jabbar as he presents his book, his latest book, Mycroft and Sherlock, The Empty Birdcage. I want to make sure that I thank the Friends of the Library who makes our author events possible. And I would also like to thank um, Barnes & Noble, bookseller, for being here this evening. Books will be available for purchase and signing at the conclusion of the event. Um, if you are interested in having your book signed and purchasing a book, we're going to have you exit this through the glass doors back there, um, and a line will come around this way. And um, he'll be happy to sign your books, your hardcover books written by him. Um, well, we are thrilled to be hosting Mr. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar this evening. Uh, we all know him as basketball's legend, NBA's all-time leading scorer, six-time MVP, Basketball Hall of Fame inductee. Following his career, he has gone on to advocate for civil rights, cancer research, science education, and social justice. He was appointed Global Cultural Ambassador and is the recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom awarded to him by former President Barack Obama. This is our nation's highest civilian honor. He is an acclaimed author, a New York Times bestselling author. He's authored 15 books. His most recent book, and the book that we're excited to present to you this evening, just released last week on September 24th, uh, Mycroft and Sherlock, The Empty Birdcage, which is the third in the series, uh, the very popular Mycroft series. Uh, moderating tonight's discussion um, with Mr. Abdul-Jabbar will be Deborah Morales, Kareem's longtime manager of 25 years and good friend. Deborah is the founder and chief executive officer of Economy Multimedia and Entertainment. Deborah has also guided the production and distribution of numerous best-selling books, music, audio soundtracks, special events, and films, including HBO's Emmy Award-winning, most-watched sports documentary of all time, Minority of One, which chronicles the life and career of her client and friend, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. So before I bring them out, we do have a special video we'd like to present to you. Take your gloves off. Let's hear it. Here is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Between my uh, sophomore and junior year, the rules committee decided to eliminate the double. I don't think they were thinking about the fact that I had the hook. I had more than one shot. was the first to play 20 years in the NBA. Unstoppable most nights, he perfected his trademark skyhook on the way to an amazing 38,387 career points.
Please join me in welcoming the legendary Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Deborah Morales. Hello, thanks for coming out tonight. We really appreciate it. So good to see so many people in Newport Beach. I don't know if you guys know this, but Kareem lives down here now. I finally got him to move. <laughs> got him out of LA, finally. So tonight, um, we're gonna discuss him being a writer and um, we're gonna discuss the Mycroft series books. So we'll have a talk for about 30 minutes and then we're gonna take some questions from you guys. And then what we're gonna do is have a book signing afterwards. Okay, so Kareem, can you, um, can you share with everybody how you first started reading about Sherlock Holmes and what got you interested? Uh, good evening, everyone. It's nice to see you all. And um, geez, my, my relationship with Sherlock basically started when I was a kid. Uh, me and all my boys on Saturdays, we would watch the uh, Sherlock Holmes Theater with the movies that uh, starred Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. Uh, they were made in England in the 30s, I think. And um, we used to watch those. We thought he was a hero. I did not um, become aware of the fact that Sherlock Holmes was not actually a real person until I got into high school and we read <laughs> The Red-Headed League. And it was the first time I realized that, no, Sherlock was never, ever a real person. But uh, I still enjoyed it. Uh, and um, finally, uh, when I was a rookie, in the NBA, someone gave me a complete compilation of all of the Arthur Conan Doyle stories in one volume. And that, uh, that lasted me for a number of road trips. It was, it was great reading, and of course, that, that really hooked me as an adult. So as you're playing in the NBA, you're a rookie, and you started reading Sherlock Holmes and learning about the powers of observation. You want to share one of the stories about how that improved your game? Well, well the powers of observation, you know, they, they enable you to uh, have an advantage. For me, it, it always amazed me that Sherlock uh, saw everything in Technicolor and everybody else was watching everything in black and white. He just had, had more insight into what was going on around him than everyone else and was able to make uh, sound decisions based on it. Wow. Um, I made, when I was that young, I made very few sound decisions. So it's, uh, it was, um, it, it was great reading about how, you know, his wisdom and uh, just his dedication to being informed uh, helped him. Um, what Deborah is referring to is though, uh, for example, I overheard the uh, ball boys in Detroit, when we would play, play the Detroit Pistons, uh, both their coach and their best player, Bob Lanier, um, they liked to smoke cigarettes at halftime. <laughs> and the ball boys complained about it. You know, they'd go in there and they'd say, geez, you almost passed out. It was, it's horrible in there. But uh, that gave me an idea because I knew that if Bob had been smoking a lot at halftime, if I could make him run a lot in the second half, <laughs> that he would be in pain and, and I would have an advantage. So, you know, the powers of observation can really help you if you, <laughs> if you don't mind in a little, uh, what, what, what's that, industrial espionage. Yeah. Yeah. I learned this firsthand from Kareem. Um, I've known him for 25 years now, and my very first outing in public with him was for um, an, an all-star game that was in L.A. And we were um, at a hotel that was like downtown in LA and Hollywood and there was like really nothing around except this hotel. Do you remember the name of it? The hotel where this was? Oh, the, the W Hotel. No, it was uh, like, it was? It was? W, yeah. Okay, well we were in the middle of nowhere, right? And 
he's wearing like shoes like this, like he is right now. And um, I said, come on, we have to go to the red carpet. He's not wearing socks, okay? That's because he lives in Newport Beach now. But this, <laughs> that wasn't always the case. So he said, Deborah, I'm not going on the red carpet. And I'm like, why? He goes, because no East Coast gentleman that's respectable is going to walk a red carpet without socks. And I forgot him. And I said, I don't care about your socks. You got to get down there. They're going to kill me. And he's like, look, you got to run across the street. This is like, you know, Main Boulevard. And he goes, see that 7-Eleven? There's a sock and tie store. And I'm like, no, come on. We're in the middle of, there is no way there's a sock and tie store above a 7-Eleven. And he refused to go down until I went over there. And sure enough, there was a pair of brown socks in the window and he had seen them. And that had blown my mind that he had observed that on the way in. And I, of course, didn't see it. But that's just, I'm, I learn all kinds of little things from Kareem, you know, when I'm with him about this. So Kareem, who's your favorite, like, film or, um, film or TV Sherlock Holmes? Who do you like to watch? Uh, I, I really enjoyed the series uh, with Jeremy Brett on, um, that was on public TV. Uh, I thought Jeremy Brett really understood Sherlock as an adult and played it the way uh, Arthur Conan Doyle wanted him to be portrayed. Was that the PBS or which no, series was uh, this? I'm not talking about Benedict Cumberbatch. I'm talking about uh, there was a long series that, and the actor that played uh, Sherlock, his, his name is Jeremy Brett. He's, he's, he's excellent. What did you think of the Robert Downey Jr. film? Oh, I, I really liked the Robert Downey Jr. because, you know, it's a... It's an action, incredible stunts and you know special effects. Um, but the the ones that get into um, the mental aspects of it are the ones that that I really enjoy. And what do you watch now? That's well, um, I, I like uh, the way that uh, even uh, on, on um, CBS um, Elementary, they they really understand uh, Sherlock's personality. You know. And you know he's dealing with addiction and, and a number of things, but he, he's on top of it, and um, that really takes some insight. I, I really like the way the uh, the actors make him come across because he he can be obnoxious to, to so many people because he's looks right past all all the artifice that most people have. You know, you have your little masks of, and Sherlock sees past all of that constantly, and um, reacts to people. Uh, the way he sees them, not not the way they think they're being seen, and that makes people really uncomfortable. See, so like how much joy he gets out of that. <laughs> no, because like, I, I dealt with people. You know, uh, Coach Wooden did things like that to us. You know, he, so he knew he was tormenting us, but he was he was getting us ready. I noticed that, like all these years that I've known you, you're always watching crime, uh, solving television shows or movies or books. What got you into all that? Uh, a lot of it had to do with the fact my dad was a police officer. I kind of identified with it. Yeah. I never, I never knew that. My dad was a police officer and my, my grandfather. Well, I mean, I knew yeah. your grandpa and your dad were police officers, but I didn't know that's the reason why you were into crime. <laughs> I, I, I'm not committing any crimes. No. No. So I know a lot of critics have said that these books are really well researched and, um, uh, done in um, Victorian England. What, why was that so important to you to have them so well researched? Well, I, I, the Victorian era is so important to England. You know, they, they were the most powerful country in the world. Their, their navy ruled the world. And, um, you know, you very rarely see an accurate de depiction of the British Empire uh, from any uh, angle other than from England. So my stories start in the British colonies, you know, the, the Chinese people in British, uh, in the British, in the, uh, Asian British colonies. Uh, my family is uh, from the island of Trinidad. That's a British colony in the, in the Caribbean with a lot of people from Africa and India and China there mixed up in quite a very interesting little gumbo in there. But, uh, you know, you, you never see that depicted. And, um, those people were also uh, going back and forth to London, and uh, they interacted with British people in London, but you, you very rarely see that depicted in how British people interacted with the people from, uh, from the colonies. So I, I kind of featured that, and it, it made for an interesting story. Okay, so we all know about Sherlock and Dr. Watson. 
but you chose to give Mycroft a sidekick that's black. Yeah. And this is the first time, right, in the, yeah, the whole entire time, canon. Yeah, um, the first time in any of these stories that uh, black people are involved in, in more than a superficial way. So when, when Arthur Conan Doyle wrote about Mycroft, he was, he was a fat guy, he was sedentary, he only went to um, three places, you can tell him, but we want to know why, I want you to, or I want to know why, why did you not write about that fat, sedentary Mycroft? Why did you write this guy that's got this whole lifestyle going on? Well, we, we wrote about Mycroft as a younger man because um, the older man had achieved so much power and prestige and he wanted to know how he got there. And he, he didn't get there being some fat guy that can't do anything but go back and forth from his office uh, to his apartment. You know, So what was that all about? How, how did he become that person? How did he achieve all the power? And how what happened to him? So you know, Mycroft has physical issues. Uh, it's good. Those of you that have read the first couple of books, you know, he's uh, um, has issues with his heart, and um, that's going to affect his health. Um, he's unlucky at love. He's he's got all these things that that uh, that happen to him. So uh, that that's why uh, Mycroft ends up in Arthur Conan Doyle, being the big fat guy who um, doesn't want to interact with too many people because he's he's been through a lot in his life. So I've I've heard you talk to your co-writer about um, this situation, and you call it like the old Marlon Brando versus the young Marlon Brando? Well, no, uh, yeah, Mar Marlon Brando in On the Waterfront versus Marlon Brando in The Godfather. You know, the fat guy in the, in the, in the garden, you know, is talking to him, listen to me, uh, Michael, listen. You know. <laughs> he didn't start out like that, you know? So, so during your first book, and this is just so you all know, this is the first one, the red one, okay? And um, this came about, just so you know, we were on an airplane and he was reading this book and he kept laughing on the airplane, like loud, you know, like embarrassing loud. And I'm like, my God, what are you doing? You know, and he's like, God, you just gotta read this. You gotta, and he would read me, you know, some of the book and everything. And he's like, if only the character could do this. And I'm like, well, why don't you write about it since you've got so many ideas? And he's like, I can't write fiction. I'm like, you've written like 10 books at that point. I'm like, of course you can write fiction. So he was nervous about it, but um, he decided to write the story of Mycroft. And so this was the first book that he did, this, this red one. Now, Kareem, in this book, there's not a lot of Sherlock Holmes in here, but in the next two books there are. Why did you decide to include him? Why did I uh, decide to include Sherlock? Yeah, in the next two books. Well, because we, you know, we wouldn't have Mycroft if, if it wasn't really for Sherlock. You know, we're going backwards, <laughs> so we're going back in time to find out how you know the relationship developed. Because Mycroft uh, helped Sherlock develop into who he was. Um, it's, it's a typical sibling thing. You know, they they fight, they they uh, are rivals, but they they love each other and support each other. And uh, trying to just show the you know sibling relationship, brothers. Uh, can, can you kind of get into develops. more like what's the difference between Sherlock and Mycroft a little bit more? Um, I, I think uh, Sherlock wants to stop things before they can happen. Uh, no, Sherlock deals with things after bad things have happened. Sherlock deals with them. Mycroft wants to deal with things before anything bad happens. He wants to push the. The, the bad things out of the way so they can't possibly happen. He's, he's you know, trying to look into the future, whereas Sherlock deals with people's problems after they've happened to them. And what about the brothers' relationship in the books? What was that like overall? Well, I, I think uh, the brothers' relationship uh, had to do with Mycroft seeing that uh, things happen to a family that you, you can't foresee, you know, there's always a problem with their mother, you know, who, who becomes uh, uh, addicted and um, they deal with that and Mycroft has to, you know, help his dad and, and Sherlock. Uh, so it, it's all, it, it, it's all about family, basically, but, you know, how, how the family issues affected these, these young men and uh, 
help form who they became as adults. Was was Mycroft like financially responsible for Sherlock and helping him grow up because of this family? No, I, I think the uh, Sherlock's parents were, but uh, after Mycroft uh, ha has his first, uh, after the first adventure, Mycroft is able to look after the, the whole family. Cool. And those of you who have read it know why. So how do you think Mycroft feels about um, Sherlock's passion for detective work? Um, at times, uh, Mycroft thinks uh, Sherlock is a little bit too um, idealistic. And um, Mycroft really is the guy that, you know, the pragmatic guy that's really looking into the future and trying to deal with things in a, in a you know, from afar, but in a very wise and prescient way, you know. Now, the, but the brothers bicker a lot in the book, but you're, you, were gro you grew up as an only child, and yeah. so did Anna. So how did you guys come up with these, you know, fights between them. Well, just everything book. I observed with, with my friends, you know. <laughs> I, I, I lived in Manhattan. I thought you were going to say me. <laughs> I lived in New York City in Manhattan in, in a housing project. There were four, in my building, 14 stories, 12 apartments on each floor, filled with kids. I was so happy I had my own room. I was an only child. I had my own room and everything. When I got my own TV, it was like the Ritz, you know. So Mycroft's best friend is Cyrus Douglas, who is the beloved character that you created for your readers. Can you tell us a little bit, something about what inspired you to create Cyrus Douglas? Well, I, I just felt that um, for a black person living in the British Empire, for them to indulge their whole thing, being an entrepreneur and, and figuring out a business and everything, that's how someone could do it, uh, coming from the island of Trinidad. And I know a little bit about the island of Trinidad, seeing how that's where my family's from. Um, so we painted an interesting picture of uh, a guy that is able to start a business, you know, tobacco and uh, fine spirits, uh, just because he lives uh, where, the, where the rum and the brandy and the tobacco are all coming from and he figures out a business. But, but he couldn't come out and say that he was a business owner, right? He had to hide. Well, you know, in, in those days there was, uh, what do they call it, um, xenophobia. You know, people saw anybody that was not um, British, you know, uh, ethnically British as being a threat. So you had to be very careful. They didn't want you uh, creeping in on, on their prosperity. So, uh, you know, th that, that was part of the issues there. Your, your grandma was from Trinidad, right? My grandmother and grandfather. Did they used to tell you any stories? My grandfather used to tell us crazy stories about vampires and stuff to scare us. You wanna sh it's almost so Halloween, wouldn't get you out of the sure bed. one. I wouldn't get out of the bed anyway. It was too cold in New York, but after that, I, you know, I can pee after 7 a.m., oh you know? God. Now, most of the stories about Victoria, England are pretty white filled with white characters. It's mm -hmm. very rare that you see black. So can you tell us something about that? Like, why do you think that black characters weren't written about in Victorian England? Well, I, I don't think that uh, the British writers understood their lives or understood where they came from. You know, they did not understand what it was like to grow up in a place like Trinidad or uh, Hong Kong, you know, a very important British city in, in Asia. Um, what was it like? Uh, to be a British person in Delhi, you know, you'd have to have to read about it. Fortunately, uh, or Rudyard Kipling wrote about that, and uh, that's why we know a little bit more about that. But uh, you know, that uh, all, look at how um, the various cultures uh, affected British literature. We have uh, the Jungle Book uh, by Kipling. You know, we we wouldn't have that if uh, the British Empire had not expanded and uh, brought all these different ideas and things and creatures into our consciousness, you know, from around the world. When you were growing up, um, were you able to find a lot of books that had black characters in them? No. And I, for example, I didn't even know about certain black authors. And people don't realize that uh, Alexander Dumas was a black author. The, the man who wrote The Three Musketeers, was his father was a white French flanner and his mother had been a slave. 
And um, his father brought the family back to France and he became a great author, but his mother was an Africa, had been an African slave. Didn't even know that. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's interesting how, how literature enables, uh, enables us to learn more and uh, ex expand our, our understanding of, of various cultures and everything. I, I think that's great. I, I love the fact that you're taking these public domain um, titles like Sherlock Holmes and you're going back and rewriting them with these types of characters. I think it's amazing and I, I personally love it and being involved in it, it's very inspiring for me. I think it gives uh, a much deeper view of the world when we're looking at things like this. So, Karim, we know that um, Cyrus Douglas cares a lot about Mycroft and their best friends and their confidants, but how does he feel about Sherlock? Well, Cyrus thinks that uh, Sherlock is a spoiled brat. So he wants to, to toughen him up and get him to, to start being a, a serious uh, young man. Um, but uh, you know, I think Mycroft understands more about Sherlock than he wants to share with uh, Douglas. But uh, Douglas loves uh, uh, Sherlock, you know, but he wants him to, to speed it up, you know, get with it. Okay, so this is the second book right here. This is the, so the red one's the first one, and then this blue one is the second one, and this is where um, we, we um, introduce Sherlock into the series. And then the one tonight that we're talking about is the yellow book, which is called The Empty Birdcage. So there's three in the series right now, and we're hoping that this is gonna continue on for a while, because we, what, what, how old were they, I guess? I forgot when, when how old is Mycroft in this book? When you started, is he? Like 25. He's just out of university and started working in the British Foreign Office. Versus how old do you think he was when Conan Doyle wrote about him? In his 60s. So that's a 25, 30 years we got, we can do. It's 40, 40 something. 40, years. yeah, there we go. There we go. Okay. So do you want to talk about um, Mycroft's love interest a little bit? Well, the the problem with, for Mycroft is that he's unlucky. You know, the, the first in the first book, his love interest ends up uh, becoming uh, influenced by the early uh, thoughts of feminism and you know asserting herself and latches on to some ev evil people who you know really corrupt her. But um, unfortunately, that. Uh, that's what happens to him on that one. And, uh, so, and then he tries to cross certain lines in, in, in our second book, he tries to cross certain lines culturally, you know, with the, with the Asian lady that uh, ends up being a, a forbidden uh, desire of him to, you know, just push all of that out of the way and uh, cross the cultural boundaries, but that can't be done. So you guys came up with this idea of bringing Asians into this book because of the opiate? Op no, I, I, no, just because, because the, these are people that uh, uh, were uh, subjects of the British Empire, people from Asia, you know, people from India, people from Burma, people from ch China, you know, it's, it's, it's a wide world out there. What, what's the crux of this book, this, uh, the empty bird cage, is it, so what does it center around? Well, it centers around just the, the fact that um, Mycroft, um, despite his, despite his uh, uh, incredible abilities, has to uh, be limited, you know, by all these conventions, you know, all these cultural conventions. Uh, it's it's just a very uh, difficult thing for him and um, it, it, it messes up his love life and um, it, it threatens uh, the lives and, and fortune of his family. So he has to, he has to be very careful. Did, did he uh, started to amass wealth, uh, his wealth in, in the second book or in the third book? In the first book. He got his wealth in the first book? He started, yeah. Okay, and, you wanna, and, you wanna and just it, talk about that a little bit? How about how he started to own things? Well, um, because of what he found out in, in the first book, he, w he was able to get 
the seed money that he uses in the second book to become uh, very wealthy and um, control real estate and um, uh, shares in the various uh, successful British trading companies. But uh, you know, he has the other things. Those are great things that are happening for him. He, he accumulates power. He uh, his job in the Foreign Office. He he's ascendant. Queen Victoria likes him, and so he's got a lot going for him, but he also has a lot of difficult things to deal with. Oh, it sounds like it could be a movie, I hope. <laughs> yeah. I hope, or a TV show, I guess. So, Cream, what do you want to write next? What's, the, what's, what's, your, what's in your brain as far as, do you want to keep writing Mycroft? Do you want to write about other subjects? Got other what subjects like that, do? that, that we're doing, um, the uh, stuff about... Um, Los Angeles, and right after World War II is, you know, the next thing. So, you want to give a little. Well, we want to just talk about Sneak how um, South Central Los Angeles was was starting to get into the whole civil rights thing. Um, the war ended. The um, prosperity and everything that was part of the. Po po post-war thing was happening. And uh, LA was a very interesting place at that time. And rock and roll and things like that started to rear their heads. I, I think that's a very interesting um, period to, to write about. And hopefully we can talk about it. So like LA's renaissance of music and entertainment and yeah. how, how, and, and and how and it was how, how the culture started to mix, you know. So that's coming up. Um, that's, a, that's a series that just got sold to Warner Brothers. And so we're in development of that. And then um, for those of you who, who don't really know what Kareem does, like, you know, he's just, you know, this basketball guy living around Newport Beach. But um, he's, he just finished writing Veronica Mars, uh, the fifth season. So that's on Hulu right now. And he was one of the writers in the writer's room. And he writes every single week for The Guardian newspaper, which is the largest online newspaper in the world. And he writes a lot of political things for them. And he writes every week for The Hollywood Reporter. So he's, he stays busy with that, and he's also in development on a movie about Louis Armstrong and about his trip to South Africa, and that's going to be coming up next as well. So I think what we're going to do next is we're going to now turn it over to you guys, and we're going to take some questions. I guess Terry has some questions. We do and have some audience we'll questions. I'm going to come to this side so you're not having to... Okay. So the first question, what do you like better? being an author or a basketball player? Well, I haven't played basketball in about 30 years. <laughs> so I have to be an author because that, that's all I have. No, but I, I really enjoyed having the opportunity to write. Um, I got opportunities to write things I never thought I'd work on. I never thought I'd be in a writing room at all. Um, but, uh, you know, to, to work for The Guardian and have my stuff uh, considered and and printed. Every, everybody who's thought about it hopes that, that 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 happens, and it's happened to me. So I'm very thankful. And I got a cool factoid for you guys. So I'm sure all of you guys know he's the all-time leading scorer in the NBA, 38,387 points. He's now written more words than points scored. Okay, next question. What player, past or present, would you like to have played against during your prime, and why? And this is from Grace. Um, geez, I, I think I, I probably would have liked to have played in, in the uh, 21st century, you know, against, in the stretch game, maybe uh, see how my three-point shot is, you know. That, that, that seems to be the, the, the trend, uh, the way that they stretch the court nowadays. So I, I think that probably would have been interesting. Your three-point shot? Yeah. How many did you make in your career? One. <laughs> okay, what were you thinking when the dunk ban went into effect at UCLA? I thought that the world was picking on me. Um, I thought that uh, 
you know, why, why they they are eliminating the dunk because they ho they're hoping that it's going to limit my effectiveness. Uh, the funniest thing about that uh, for me was some 40 or 50 years later, I, I find out uh, from Coach Wooden that he he voted for the ban of the dunk. <laughs> he was involved in, you know, when they got together and said, we're going to see if we're going to eliminate the dunk. He voted with the coaches that wanted to eliminate the dunk shot. And then he can, went on to win seven more um, NC2A championships in a row. I don't know, he's a scheming little man. <laughs> okay. um, what do you think would be the public reaction in this political climate to your name change if you were an active player? Well, I, I think um, because of all we've been through in the Middle East since uh, the 9-11 um, attack, people understand what Islam is all about. And um, I, I don't think that it would be a problem of them understanding what I was doing, but really what my motive was. Do I hate my country? Do I hate Christians or anything, you know, or is it a religious thing? For me, it was a religious uh, change. I did not uh, change my religion because I, I wanted to conquer the world. And, um, you know, that it was very easy to understand why America got split along those lines because you know, people didn't know and they didn't understand Islam or understand, you know, what was motivating these people. The, the, the problem is there's no chance for anybody to have a decent life in what is where all the Muslims live. It, despots, uh, you know, kingdoms or military dictatorships or, or just uh, crazy dictators that suppress uh, everybody and their family or, or their clan gets to prosper and the rest of the country suffers. That's what you have to look forward to if, you, if you're raised in a, an Islamic country and they've taken their anger out on whatever, you know, anybody, uh, it's irrational. They, they're just, they're suffering that much. So I, I would hope that people would understand that and understand why the conflict is. And um, hopefully uh, we, we can do something to, to eliminate this threat because it threatens all of us. It's really cool that you have so many friends from different ethnicities and nationalities and religions, including me, I'm Jewish. And I never would have met Kareem. I mean, and we were friends for 10 years before we worked together. We didn't have anything in common to talk about. So we looked for ways to bring us together to talk about things. And it was through books and articles and uh, things that we could discuss. And I think that's a great way to go meet people. Thank you for answering that. That was so eloquently. That was a, that's a big question. Um, OK, from Arianne. Who is your favorite teammate? <laughs> My favorite team, geez. You know, I played with Oscar Robertson and Magic Johnson, both of whom thought it was their job to get the ball to the guys who could score, and that was me. So I gotta love those two guys, you know? <laughs> and uh, just, you know, I, I, I had great friends, you know, Byron Scott, James Worthy, a guy I played with in Milwaukee, Greg Smith, Flynn Robinson, he, he, one of the great things about playing uh, professional sports, you get to travel with a bunch of goofy guys and get to know them and uh, make friends, uh, friendships that last forever and friendships that, that open your mind and uh, open, open your life. So uh, th that's been the best of, of, of my career, you know, just the things that I've experienced in addition to, you know, all the banners and everything, the, the life has been wonderful. Had a few favorites. Okay, next question. Can you tell us about your time with Bruce Lee? Uh, I met Bruce while I was going to UCLA and uh, trained with him for four years. He's a great guy. Um, I'm really upset about this movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. It depicts Bruce as a jerk. He was not a jerk. He was a gentleman and uh, really... Uh, someone that the martial arts community could be proud of. He did not go around and try to intimidate people and act like a jerk the way they depicted in that movie. I just want to say that because uh, 
it, that that bothers me, you know, when, when they do a hatchet job on him and he's not here to defend himself. You can uh, Google The Hollywood Reporter and you can look at Kareem's view, re review of Once Upon a Time. I can tell you Quentin Tarantino was not happy. <laughs> not happy at all. Which game is your most memorable? Oh, uh, geez, probably game two of the finals in 1985 when we, uh, you know, the, the game after the Memorial Day Massacre, you know, we came back and uh, beat the Celtics and went on to win the next three or four games to beat the Celtics for everything for the very first time. So that with that one game, that that's my game. A couple more. Um, who was your most difficult and or favorite opponent? Well, uh, I'd, I'd have to say, you know, just in terms of size and intimidation, it would have to be Wilt. I mean, Wilt weighed over 300 pounds and was like twisted blue steel. <laughs> Seriously. Um, of course, he, he could not keep up with me. He did not have the quickness. <laughs> And I, I made sure that I played Br'er Rabbit to his, uh, what's that, Br'er Bear that's going to bash his head in? <laughs> going to be like Br'er Rabbit, you know. That had to be my game. <laughs> um, this is from Cheyenne. What is your second favorite sport? Um, basketball. Um, I, uh, I got to explain that, right? Because my first favorite sport, I was born the day after Jackie Robinson played his first game. Uh, I was a Brooklyn Dodger fan. I went to games at Ebbets Field. I went to two games at Ebbets Field, folks. So, um, yeah, baseball has always been my first love. So that's why I said that. And from Kian or Kian, um, do you like Marvel? If you do, who is your favorite character? Um, I, you know, Marvel, I think, is great. I mean, it's very entertaining, but I can't keep up with it. You know? <laughs> There's so many people that have died and come back and, and gone to another dimension. and, and they, I don't know what's going on. And, you know, and it used to be just like, you know, Batman and Superman. And I could keep track with that, you know? But um, I, I think the movies are, are great entertainment. You know, the, the stunts and uh, you know special effects are out of this world. Yeah. Okay, and this is our last question. Does anybody in the current NBA have anything close to your skyhook? No, but they've got some guys. Uh, you know, people like uh, Kevin Durant and Stephon Marbury. To, they're shooting the ball from out there where they're popping the corn. You know, they're, they're out there close to, like, the bathrooms and shooting. <laughs> you know, the, the long-range jumper has come into its own. So I, I think that's, uh, that's really helped the game maintain its popularity. Well, thank you both so much for being here this evening. It's been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you. Um,